Uh, my name's Lauren. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, and basically, well, I feel out of totally out of the loop now. In I'm I'm typically developing with Rails Ruby like majority of the time. So Lewis, uh, all your slides there were kind of helpful. Um, I feel kind of out of the loop because I've been immersed in Elixir. Let me just minimize the hangout window so I can see. Okay. Um, I've been immersed in Elixir Phoenix land for the last couple months, converting an internal application. Uh, it's called El Formo. It's just simple form processing. Um, and it's written in uh, Ruby Rails. And I've been converting it to Elixir Phoenix as a way to learn uh, Elixir and Phoenix. And I do have to say that I I've gone through like the getting started guides uh, for both Elixir and Phoenix and nothing really sank in until I like dove in, rolled up my sleeves and started working on this project. So if you're interested in, um, you know, learning something new like that, uh, it definitely starts to really sink in once you kind of dive in. Uh, and so to start off, I feel like I had to wrap my my mind around switching from the paradigm of object oriented to functional, and I feel like the best way. I don't know if this is if this is the most appropriate way to summarize, but you could think if you're used to Ruby, um, this is kind of how I see it. It's like building a Ruby or a Rails application using only class methods. So. On the left here, I have an example of what a functional approach for that would look like in Ruby. Um, so you can see the, the important bit is that we're passing user into full name. So there is no state that we're maintaining everything. Just every function receives exactly what it needs, which is hard to and almost a little frustrating at first. I'm like, give me my instance methods. Uh, but after a while, you start to get used to it and actually it starts to be really nice because you know exactly what's going on because you're getting everything you need right there in that, uh, that function. So on the right is the Elixir version. And actually, it, it should feel, it feels very similar like to Ruby. Um, there's definitely differences, but it's almost pretty like side by side, pretty comparable. So one thing that I also had to get used to was to embrace pattern matching. So in Elixir, you can define a function with the same name multiple times with different parameters, and it will pattern match on the parameters that you pass. So in this example here, which I'll talk about change sets later, this is the equivalent of creating a structure of data to pass to a repository that will get inserted into your database. and um here if you were to call say from your controller change set with this uh in ruby it's called a symbol in elixir it's an atom this is the function that would get executed and also there's pattern matching on data structures that are returned which is nice for handling like logic flow so in your controllers this is usually happening a lot where you're calling some kind of method uh, from your domain layer and you're getting back a result and then you're matching on that result and then if it matches you execute this branch if it matches here you execute this branch branch and something that i as i was going along learning Elixir and Phoenix, what always would help me is comparisons to Rails, because if someone can point to something in Rails and say, it's just like this in Rails, or it's just like this in Ruby, I found that helpful. So in this case, I would equate it to a pattern that I started to see in service objects where you would return like a result object because you wanted to return more than just true and false. So this is a great, I mean, you can return really any data structure you want here. It's super flexible. So first up is, um, we're kind of going to go through and just compare, because like I said, that was approaching it in that way helped me. So I can point at something in Rails and say this, this is the equivalent in Elixir or Phoenix. So we've got Rake in Ruby, and we have Mix in Elixir, and they are very similar. So you'll feel right at home. Um, these commands should look familiar to you. This is generating. Uh, the equivalent of generating a new 
Rails app. This is the equivalent of running your Rails server. Ecto is the database layer in Phoenix. Um, so this is the equivalent here would be rake db migrate. This is to generate some scaffolding in Elixir, or I'm sorry, in Phoenix is called HTML. Running your tests is straightforward. And I just wanted to throw this example in here so that you could see that you can do like the same thing, like you pass Rails env to uh, run within a different environment. And uh, Mix is essentially straight from the docs is a build tool that provides tasks for creating, compiling, and testing Elixir projects and managing its dependencies and more, more than that. Next up is IR, IRB in Ruby versus IEX in Elixir. So IEX is Elixir, Elixir's interactive shell. And you run it within your Elixir, Elixir project using IEX-S, which is for script, stands for script. And uh, this is a file right here, just leaving off the file extension and every Elixir project has it. It's mix.exs. So it's running the shell, um, running the script beforehand to, to load some stuff, do some setup. Um, to exit the shell, you have to hit control C twice, which took a little getting used to him. So we used to hitting control D. So that was just a little, I don't know, small little quirk that at first I didn't really like too much. Um, but now I'm so used to it. Uh, one thing that I didn't realize until after I had been working a while was uh, when I'm doing development, I don't know about you guys, but I like having um, a Rails console open at all times. And I usually have like some state in there, whether I'm debugging something. And I, I hate when I exit out and I lose all that, that state, like all my variables and stuff. So in Elixir, I was exiting out whenever I'd make a change to a file because Elixir is compiled and like restarting my shell session and losing all of the state that I had built up. Whereas you don't have to do that and you can just call recompile right from the shell, which is nice. And another thing that is nice to know about that I didn't know about at the beginning was a .iex file, which the you can use to, I'm sure you can do other things than this, but I have all my aliases. So in Elixir, you have to, unless you want to write out, um, for example, I would have to write out, you know, my app dot repo dot all. And in order to be able to just call repo dot all, you use uh, aliases. So, and then this was another thing that kind of tripped me up at first. The first time I, I went into the shell, I was like, okay, how to get the first user from the database, you know, Rails is just user dot first. And this is the equivalent in Phoenix, which is kind of ugly and a lot to type. Um, but that's how you get it. And there's a way around having to type this every time you can define, you know, some helper functions that you can use. Um, so that was just something that, you know, so simple, simple things like that, you don't realize the convenience of it when you're used to using something like user dot first. So next up is mini test versus X unit. Um, I'm a big uh, fan of mini test. I, I've used RSpec like a little bit, but I'm very familiar, I'm much more familiar with mini, set, mini tests. So I felt right at home personally uh, using X unit. Very similar syntax, very similar like behavior and functionality. You have describe, um, which can only be one level. You can't do uh, multiple describe levels, which is probably a good thing because if you're having to do multiple describe levels, then you maybe want to kind of rethink how your code's structured. Um, of course, this should look familiar as well, the test keyword and your description. Um, you've got the setup, which should also look familiar. One difference is that you need to return uh, this structure here with uh, an OK atom and any of the data that you want available in every test. So this setup runs before each test, and then you can pattern match uh, on exactly what you need. So in this test, I might not need the user, so I just need the connection. Um, another thing that's slightly different is that there aren't really any special assert uh, functions in XUnit. Typically, this is what you're seeing, like assert and refute. Uh, there's a cert raises, and I think there's a couple others, but in general, you're going to be just calling a cert, and then this is the kind of the meat of it. And the reason for that is because the test output, which I'll show on the next slide, is really nice, and you don't need those special um, functions to tell you what went wrong. So, and then you just run your tests with mix test, which feels familiar, and then you can also run individual tests, uh, and you can also run 
individual tests within a module using a colon and then line number at the end of the file, which is nice. And here is the example of the test failure output. So it's very uh, helpful and part of why you don't need to have special assert methods or functions. Um, so it tells you exactly the line that failed. You could see the code and you've got left hand side, which means that some function here returned 13 and you were asserting against the right hand side, which was 10. So of course that fails. All right, active record models versus ecto schemas. So ECT is, is kind of like active record equivalent, but not quite. There's a lot of similarities between Rails and Phoenix, but there's also a lot of differences. Um, so ECTO is a domain specific language for writing queries and interacting with databases in Elixir. Um, Chris McCord, who is the developer that created Phoenix, he gave a keynote uh, during uh, the 2016 Elixir Phoenix conference, and he emphasized that, that in Phoenix, they want to move away from using the term model. So in the project that I'm working on, I'm running Phoenix 1.2, which is still kind of using that term. Um, but I think in the next version that's coming out, which I think is 1.3, they're going to move away from that. I don't know what they're going to call it, like what they're going to use, but I know that Ecto, which is actually a third party package, um, they, I think, dropped the term model as well. And I think, I don't know the history, but I think in its place, they use schema. So this is an example, like you could equate this to a Rails active record model. Um, so it's just a module and you're pulling in some uh, helpful things with this statement here. And then you're just defining your schema, which is kind of like the layer on top of, you know, it's like the layer in between your, your schema and your database. Um, but as you can see, you can have virtual fields, which is nice for things like contact forms. If you leave this schema name blank, uh, there, it, it's indicating that there's no database behind this schema here. Um, so like I said, for example, contact forms, something you get all the benefits of like, you know, defining data types and you can do validations without having to have a database. And uh, this should, this is just the default, like in Rails, how we have the default timestamps. Um, let's see. All right. So Ecto has like four main components. So I've already talked about schema. Next up is change set. Um, and this is the same module here. So it's this, it's our, our user schema. I'm just showing you now what the change set component, how that behaves. So uh, I've eliminated most of what was on the previous slide just to save some space so you can see uh, how change set works. So change set is one of these things that's kind of very different from Rails. We don't, I wouldn't say there's any equivalent in Rails, um, but it solves a lot of the problems like that we have in Rails with callbacks and that sort of thing. Um, change sets are specifically for casting data casting, validation, filtering, calculations, like all of that is going to happen in your change sets. So there is no instance, there's no instance of a user that you're saving, you're creating a change set and then you're passing that to the repository and it's gonna insert that if the change set is valid, which I'll show uh, in an in a upcoming slide. And so as you can see here, this is these are kind of like the equivalent of constants in Ruby. Um, and uh, should, should look relatively straightforward. Um, and so here you can call this uh, anything you want. You don't have to call it change set. Um, you're defining it yourself and you're passing in the user in Elixir. It's called a struct, which is very similar to what a struct is in Ruby. And then you're passing in params, which are typically from, you know, a form or an API request. And then you're starting out, if you're not familiar with Elixir, this is called the pipe operator. And all it's doing is taking this first bit of data and it's passing it as the first parameter to the this first function call. So if you just imagine that user goes here, and so params is actually the second, the second argument or the second parameter. So this cast is coming from the change set behavior, um, and it's just looking at your schema and making sure everything's copacetic. And then you've got validations that you can run. I don't have any listed out here, but 
Phoenix comes with a handful of, you know, ones that you'd be familiar with if you're coming from Rails, like validate required, validate numbers, validate min, max, length, that sort of thing. Um, let me just see if I make sure I covered everything. Oh, and also too, like for example, you know, we've got a user schema here. We'd probably have a password. Change set is where you would encrypt the password. So you can define any function you want within this module and call it within this chain of uh, functions to transform your data to prepare it for insertion or update. Oh, another thing just want to mention is, um, so instead of callbacks, instead of using callbacks, the preferred method in Phoenix is to use different change sets. So we typically use in Rails callbacks because of the different contexts that we have. For example, the difference between inserting and updating or the difference between a user registering and a user updating their password. Um, so you can do that a couple ways. Uh, the method that I use in this project I'm working on is I just name the change set after the type of update that it is. So I have a change set called registration change set and I might have a change set called insert change set or update change set depending you know context specific and then you can do all that context context specific stuff in that particular um function all right the third component of ecto is the repository or repo and this um little chunk of code you see right here is actually generated automatically for you by Phoenix. And I haven't actually, I don't think I've added anything to it in the project I'm working on, but I would imagine you could add like little helper methods here, helper functions here. For example, this is where I would put a uh, dot first, you know, so in the beginning of the talk I mentioned when you're in your shell, you want to grab the first user from the database, database you could define that here so it's a nice short thing to type when you're in uh, IEX. And then here's just some examples of the type of functions you'd be calling in your application. So here you would have a change set that you'd pass to repo insert or repo update. This just retrieves all your users. Um, this is actually kind of a little strange, but it's just a getting account. Uh, and there's some things that are a little more verbose in Elixir uh, compared to Rails, which it takes a little getting used to, but sometimes I like that. I like, uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure it's like, it's a, it's a thing that Elixir is purposely explicit about stuff. Um, and then here's just a simple example of like, you can do composable queries and then you would pass that query to either repo all if you were expecting more than one or you pass it to one. Uh, and if you got more than one result back, it would raise an error. Um, I know there's a lot, like there's a lot of information on how to do queries that I actually haven't really gotten into yet. I've kind of, these are the types of functions that I've been calling so far. I haven't really needed to go this route yet. So um, that's why I'm, I'm not including much more than this. Um, so repo, repo is essentially the database wrapper. Um, also one thing I just want to mention is in Rails we have, um, like a lot of associations are automatically loaded for us and in Phoenix or in Ecto, I should say, they aren't. You have to preload associations manually, which at first is really frustrating because you get used to all these like nice convenient things, but it's actually a good thing because it forces you to think about your data and what you're pulling back and you're not always pulling down everything um, from the database just for a couple fields. Um, so it kind of kind of forces you to think about your data in a way that ends up being a good thing. So controllers, um, there's really no difference, I would say. There's maybe a couple things. So one thing is that in Phoenix, they use a singular naming convention, which kind of tripped me up at first because I'm so used to. And I think part of the reasoning for that is they felt like people got tripped up on it uh, in Rails, so they decided to go with singular. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful. I, everyone's so used to plural, but oh well. Um, and then this is just, it should look pretty familiar. You have each action is, is a function 
and every action uh, receives this connection parameter as the first parameter, which contains all of like the request information. It'll re contain the response information, which is really nice because you can hop into a shell and you can ins inspect this. And it's really it's really basic and straightforward to look at. It's just a simple data structure. Um, and then here's your params, which are going to come from you know the URL or um, uh, form post data. Uh, and then this uh, one thing to note is that rendering is explicit, which again, Elixir favors expli explicitness. So um, I actually really like that rendering is explicit. It makes it very easy to read. You, it's very straightforward what's going on. And uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. It looks very similar to a uh, render statement in Rails. It's, this is the template. And then uh, you're passing in the um, variables that the template's going to use. And then the, in your router, which is also very similar to Rails, your um, routes map directly to your controller actions, which should feel very familiar. And then uh, in Rails, we have before action, which in Phoenix is available through the use of plugs, which I'll touch on a little bit. So this is something that's different in Phoenix. So in Rails, we have views. And in Phoenix, there's views and templates. And a Rails view is not a Phoenix view. A Phoenix view is actually just a module. So this right here, this little chunk is a Phoenix view. And the view handles the template rendering. Um, and it also can be a great place to define functions, like helper functions for your templates, which I would say templates are actually the equivalent. Uh, Phoenix templates are the equivalent of Rails views. And they use uh, EEX, which is similar to ERB. So EEX is embedded Elixir. And one thing to note that I actually still continue to get tripped up on is anytime you have like a conditional or a for loop, in ERB, you don't have to have the equal sign. Um, but in uh, embedded Elixir, you do. Otherwise, nothing will get output. You'll just get blank. So that has tripped me up a couple times. Um, and we've got rack, middleware versus a plug. Um, so I'm not, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, plugs. I did build an authentication plug. That's the extent of my experience. But basically, I'm aware of two ways that you can define plugs. It's actually very straightforward and, and simple to do. Um, and quite powerful, like simple yet powerful. So in this way, this is actually how I defined the authentication plug in the app that I'm working on. So it has to call, it has to define these two functions here specifically. Um, and then you can pass it in your router at the router level. So this is a little different from Rails, but basically, so here's, you've got your resources routes defined here and you're scoping uh, on this path, and then you're saying all these routes I want to pipe through, uh, and this is a list, so you can actually add multiple pipelines here. So I want to pipe these routes through this pipeline, and this pipeline I've named it auth uh, is contains these plugs. Well, right now I just have one plug, but I could have as many plugs as I wanted. So Phoenix actually comes with some like built-in plugs for like uh, cross-site uh, CSRF protection. Um, I can't think of the top of my head. There's like a handful of other ones. Um, and that's, that's nice and um, pretty powerful as well. And then so the other way to define it is at the controller level. So you can just call plug and then any method name and you just have to define these two methods with these uh, function signatures and then implement the actual behavior that you want to happen. And you can actually pass in like in Rails how you have before action and you can say only or accept. You can do the same thing here. I just don't have it in this example, but you can say, you know, authenticate only for these specific controller actions. And then we've got Ruby gems versus hex packages. And uh, this is also very similar to Rails. You've got a list of your dependencies and to add a dependency, you just add the line with the version and you run mix steps.get, just like bundle installers bundle. And hex is the package manager for the Erlang ecosystem, um, but also for Elixir as well. And just one small little thing, I'm so used to when I'm looking for like the gem documentation or just for gems, um, I usually type the gem name and then the word or the, the keyword gem. And when I first like, it was like 
maybe four or five times that I went to do that for uh, Elixir, and I'm like, wait, what are they called? They're not gems. What the heck? Uh, packages. So uh, if you're looking for Elixir packages, use the package keyword. And then debugging, there's really no comparison. Uh, Rails and Elixir both use Pry, and uh, IEX.Pry comes with Elixir, I'm pretty sure. Uh, you can also, of course, use generic puts and IO inspect, which is very similar to what you have uh, in Rails Ruby. Two things that you that I got tripped up on is uh, you have to run your Phoenix server through your IEX, uh, through the shell. So you run this command and the Phoenix server starts up through the shell and then uh, you require IEX in the file that you want to debug, but you have to do it at the very top of the file before any modules are defined because it's compiled. And then you can add IEX.pry just like you would in Rails Ruby, wherever you want the debugger to drop you in. And then just like you would in Rails Ruby, you would refresh your browser and then go back to your shell session and you would see a prompt that says, you know, you're starting a session, do you want to continue? Something along those lines. And um, and then you can call respawn to, uh, once you're done inspecting things and troubleshooting, debugging, call respawn and it'll continue and finish the request. And just two final tips that really didn't fit in anywhere else. Um, one is use to use I use IX. I still have to remind myself this. I'm so used to in Rails and Ruby. Um, Rails like look inspecting like the request object is just not something you do uh, because it's so massive. Like it's monster objects that are you just there's no benefit in really looking at them. Um, and in Elixir and Phoenix, that's not the case. I have yet to come across a data structure that's pages and pages of, uh, you know, properties and data. So here's just an example from the shell. I'm calling a change set function that I've defined, and this is what's returned. And it's just it's straightforward. You can see all of the the uh, attributes that are available, the action, here's the changes that get passed in, so the params that you pass, it's just so straightforward, errors, and the original data, which is coming from the, the struct that you're passing, and then of course, valid, um, just super straightforward. Um, very, access feels just very accessible. And also something I like to remind myself of, I don't know if anybody else relates to this, but I have a tendency to wanna to like do it right the first time. And I think I actually talked about this in my previous talk. Um, it's just something that has really helped me. I think maybe even Sandy Met said something along those lines, like make the mess. And then once you see the mess, the improvements and the refactorings and the abstractions, they all become so much more obvious. And also too, especially I find because I'm learning not only a new language, but I'm learning a new framework. Um, like I don't know what I'm doing to start. So once I've, once I have it working, at least I know how I got it working, and I have that much more information. And now I find that the improvements that I can make are uh, again like they're just so much more clear once it's all in front of me. And so I just want to give out a shout out to Grok Lewis. I miss you already. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's who I work for, doing mostly Ruby Rails. Well, like I said, I've been doing Elixir Phoenix. Uh, Grok does web applications, mobile applications. I'm at Lauren Fackler on Twitter, and the app that I've been converting is, uh, like I said, one of our internal applications. It's El Formo. It's form processing. If you want to check that out, if you have any need for that, and thank you guys very much for listening. All right, I just have to figure out. Okay. Thanks, guys. Any questions? Where did you get a pink John Deere hat? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves this hat. I don't, I'm like not even a John Deere. Fan. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think my uh, my boyfriend got it from his friend who works at John Deere. That's where I got it from. It's pretty. It's pretty nice. I kind of like it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the question. <laughs> so after oh, go ahead. after you're done with the application, like where, how all that host server? I mean, is it is it just like a, a Heroku app, just like Rails or? 
Yeah, I'm actually going to have to figure that all out. I'm still in the midst. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, I'm like in the middle of doing, still converting it. So um, I know I can do Heroku. I've seen articles uh, on that. Um, but I think we kind of wanted to go the uh, AWS route. But uh, I don't know. It's a lot of new stuff. So I feel like Heroku is always so easy that I might want to just throw it up on Heroku just for sake of simplicity to start because, like I said, it's, it's a lot of newness for me. So, yeah, I've yet to tackle that. That'll be another talk, I guess. Have you, uh, have you uh, played around with uh, Elm? Um, I feel like I probably got like halfway through, you know, the getting started tutorial months ago. I remember I've, I've dabbled with like Elm and React and it's the other E is it Ember. I think it's Ember. Um, and, and then, and then I forget cause it's been months. Why, why do you say that? Do you feel like it would be a good combination? Uh, Reason I say this because like I was looking at a lot of the syntax in your examples and it looks very similar to Elm. <laughs> okay, that's the sense I get too. Yeah, I'm definitely interested. I'd like to. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see like a project where um, it's like Elixir Phoenix and Elm or uh, something like that on the front end. So uh, why, why did you uh, switch to Elixir and uh, Phoenix? I know uh, like I, I this is a Ruby meetup, but I don't really write Ruby. I write Python and like. Uh, uh, the the thing is that it's really fast, right? And that's because of the the like multi processing or something like that, right? And yes, right. So, like for example, like running your tests, you run in a separate process. Um, so it's something that I'm also that's a new concept to me as well. Um, I haven't typically ever worked on applications that required that. Um, I think you know part of it was more just I just was a learning experience to see what it was all about. And I feel like my Ruby code will probably, once I start writing it again, uh, will be improved because of you know such a different shift uh, in how I write code. I'm, I'm like years of object oriented programming and now I'm doing, you know, uh, functional. Um, so there, it wasn't like a, like a performance decision. It was just like, I want to learn this and just see what this is all about. And, uh, and at first I felt like, why, you know, why bother? Like I'm so productive in Rails, I'm so productive, I know what I'm doing. Um, but I feel like I'm starting to see the benefits of it and it's a nice um, tool to have in your, in your tool belt uh, after having worked on it. But I can't say that I would have known that until I actually got, you know, got my hands dirty with it. So um, I think it's, it's different. I don't know if I would necessarily say like, oh, I would choose, you know, Elixir Phoenix over it would it would depend on what the project was. I still feel pretty new to it, so I'd probably you know go for safety if it was something that I felt like I needed to uh, you know a project where I needed to to have more familiarity with the tool set. Does that answer your question? Um, so I do have a couple of forms that are on El Formal. Is this going to replace El Formal? So, say that again. It sounded a little muffled. Let me turn my volume. <laughs> um, uh, no, so I have a couple of forms on El Formo. Uh, oh, okay, cool. El Formo. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so you'll be like, maybe you can uh, test it out for me. I'll yeah. get up like a state, a staging server or something. My question was, this is going to replace it then? Uh, yeah, yeah. At some point. Um, you know, this is an internal project. So if, you know, if a client project comes in the door, then that's probably something I'd have to do in my, you know, professional development time. Um, so it might slow things down, but right now I'm kind of working full steam ahead on just that at the moment. Um, so yeah, but hopefully from your perspective, nothing should technically change. It's just an exact, you know, port the behavior wise, I'm not changing any behavior. So how long how long did it take for you to, to uh, feel somewhat comfortable with uh, with Phoenix? Were you pretty productive right away, or no, no, not at all, not at all. I think, uh, um, and I still feel like at times I'm like, oh, this is taking so long. I I feel like I'm taking too long, um, but there's just so many. Like I said, it's a new language, it's a new framework, it's a new programming paradigm. So as far as comfort, I would say, I would say 
I feel I'm so embarrassed to admit this, but like a solid month of full time of, and I still feel like, you know, um, every day when I go to do something slightly different, there's always some kind of new thing that I have to, you know, look up or research or figure out. Um, so yeah, I would say for, for me, at least I'm sure everybody's different, but for me, it was like a good solid, good solid month of, of like undoing the object oriented mindset. And like I said, just the newness of like syntax and new methods to call and new, new everything pretty much. I mean, there's a lot of similarities, which is nice. So that definitely helps. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys.